Growing up in the early 2000s, YouTube was the place to be. Shane Dawson, Ryan Higa, Smosh, Philip DeFranco, and Ray William Johnson ran the scene trading places for the most subscribed YouTubers ever. As time went on, YouTube seemed to blow up, incorporating new genres. For a while, vloggers and storytime videos reigned supreme. This included creators like Dan Is Not On Fire, Amazing Phil, Zoella, Casey Neistat, and many, many more. Later, there was a huge growth within the gaming sect of YouTube, spawning legendary YouTubers like PewDiePie, Markiplier, and groups like the Sidemen. A new culture was being created, including brand new people and identities. To myself and many others, it was a new frontier of fame, which was a breath of fresh air in comparison to the mainstream celebrity culture of stars from Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel. YouTube helped platform a beautiful community of people sharing stories, experiences, and laughter. And to encapsulate this tremendous accomplishment, YouTube created YouTube Rewind. It was a celebration of this budding culture that was taking over the masses. Originally, it was super well received, garnering millions of views and likes. But as time went on, more creators joined, becoming the entertainment industry that people wanted to take part in. As more diverse creators started to join the website, they began making more niche content for a more specific group of fans. With more people creating and viewing videos, more people joined the YouTube Rewind, resulting in the worst rewind ever created. Most viewers considered the 2018 Rewind to be so detached from the community that the 2018 version only received 2 million likes with a staggering 20 million dislikes. But this is what people like myself considered to be the death of an organic YouTube culture. This was a movement away from a group of commonly known figures in the community to a celebration of figures who created their fame outside of the YouTube ecosystem. This was a gradual change. Starting in 2016, YouTube Rewind consisted of very popular YouTubers, as well as an introduction of A-list celebrities. During this time, Dwayne The Rock Johnson and James Corden were featured. The following year in 2017, featured Stephen Colbert. And the final YouTube Rewind featured Will Smith. Yeah, it's rewind time. Trevor Noah and John Oliver. To many, this was not a celebration of YouTubers who started their career on the platform. Instead, it was a celebration of outsiders stepping into a community that wasn't built for them. Over time, the community increasingly saw YouTube become more of a corporatized entity through its promotion of mainstream media figures, rather than a unique cradle of internet culture. But what if I told you that unintended consequences regarding artificial intelligence alongside frantic business decisions resulted in the character of YouTube dying? Let's jump back to 2016. At this time in YouTube's history, nearly 600,000 hours of video was being uploaded to the platform every day, an amount of content that was beginning to become too large to handle. So the staff of YouTube decided to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to moderate and promote content on its platform. Prior to this change, the algorithm was designed to only promote content which had a high amount of watch time, keeping users engaged with the site for as long as possible. The only way content was policed was through its machine learning algorithms, which was primarily used to prevent nudity on the platform. YouTube tweaked the algorithm to not just prompt longer videos, but to also begin recommending videos to viewers. Some creators began to game the system, creating an alarming trend of innocent viewings of Let's Plays leading to conspiracy theories and fake news. But according to Influencer Marketing Hub, they claim that YouTube's AI system had only two goals, to help viewers find videos that they want to watch, as well as maximizing long-term viewer engagement and satisfaction. They also claim that this dramatically changed the types of videos it has served up to people. It was criticized for highlighting conspiracy theories and fake news. As 2016 was the year of the US presidential election, YouTube needed to show advertisers that YouTube was safe and brand friendly to maintain its massive growth. It owed that to creators, right? So YouTube was in a really tough spot strategically. Their AI was promoting conspiracy theories during a major election, but they were also trying to show that YouTube was friendly to advertisers at the same time. In an attempt to moderate content in the wake of an increase of misinformation and conspiracy theories, YouTube had to learn from their competition. Social media sites like Reddit and Twitch had a community-driven style of policing through moderators who could work in tandem with community leaders. Their other option would be similar to that of Twitter or Facebook, which uses artificial intelligence algorithms to promote and police content. 
To give better context, here are some clips from Smarter Every Day which exemplifies these differences. Just a personal observation, Reddit seems to be way more hands-off when it comes to this stuff than other social media platforms, but it's also way more community-focused. Renee DiResta has a ton of experience studying this information online, so I asked her what she thought about this community-driven approach. First, there's a, an interesting idea there, which is that the community should decide what kind of content it wants to tolerate, right? And um, and so you do see things like, I think there's a subreddit where um, you can only post a picture of a cat, and if you post a picture of a dog, like, you know, it's deleted and banned. And nobody goes in there and screams that they're being censored because they couldn't post the dog into the cat subreddit. So it's interesting in light of, like, the moderation challenges faced by, like, Twitter and Facebook, where there's this expectation that one moderation standard is is uh, is fit for the whole community. I do think Reddit is an interesting experiment in seeing how that much more hands-on moderation kind of activity works. And then also, when the community reports these weird accounts coming in, um, there is a little bit more of like, you know, you as a member of that community have a better sense of like where that uncanny valley is, where like the content's not quite right. The um, the person typing the account, like, you know, sorry, the person typing the comment gets it just a little bit wrong. They don't understand um, the community they're yeah, interacting with. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Line and say there's a certain type of content that we're not going to allow on the platform. Right? For pornography, us, for example. Pornography, yeah. hate yeah. speech, graphic violence. Right. But what we see in the data, and this is not true only on social media, it's also true offline, is that as content gets closer and closer to that line, it can actually get more engagement, right? That's so if you think right. about cable news, right? It can be more engaging when things get closer and closer to provocative, sensational. But we actually have the ability to try to change the shape of that curve so that as content gets closer to that line, it gets less engagement, not more. And that creates a better experience Whoa. for people and a better environment for the community while also making it a lot harder for bad actors to try to game the systems to achieve their own objectives. With this in mind, it makes sense that YouTube would care more about a community-driven solution, as the community was already enraged that their content was not being promoted in the same way that it once was. So they announced YouTube Heroes in the worst possible way. YouTube Heroes was a program announced in September of 2016. It was designed to allow YouTube to offset policing of content to the community. This would allow specific YouTube heroes, or moderators, to create custom closed captions for a community, mass flag videos, as well as directly contact YouTube. Instantly, there was backlash within the community, as easily discernible vulnerabilities within the proposed system seemed to be too large. Closed captions could easily be taken advantage of by bad actors, allowing for trolls to incorrectly change what was being said by the creator. Holy shit, YouTube have actually done something right! Oi! Oh, YouTube are doing something right for once. Awestruck, it's fucking hell. YouTube have actually done something which isn't going to essentially kill themselves in the process. Congratulations. Additionally, their mass flagging of videos was considered to be an easier way for internet trolls to easily spread hate and take down videos. Furthermore, individual creators at the time, and currently at this point in time, have a difficult time trying to get in contact with people at YouTube. So this solution seemed like it was riddled with errors. YouTube quickly pulled the plug on this venture and rebranded the program as YouTube Community Contributors. It still had the custom captioning, but no ability to contact YouTube nor mass flag videos. These criticisms were valid. You can even see that on Pyro's video criticizing the Heroes program, it still contains closed captions from community contributors. Have you seen auto-generated subtitles? They've improved a bit, but honestly, just go to the subtitles Turn on Mandarin and you'll be able to understand pretty much on the equivalent as if they were in English. But yeah, YouTube, nice choice because now people are inclined to add subtitles to my videos. Even though all they're probably going to say is probably. Replacing every single word I say with XD, that'll probably be a thing as well. So even though this is a good idea, I can see it massively backfiring. For a while, YouTube went back to almost a normal state. But soon, creators and users alike started to notice something. A-list celebrities like Ellen DeGeneres, Jimmy Kimmel, James Corden, and more started to make their way onto the scene. YouTube loved this, as advertisement-friendly members of the media started to use their platform. Soon, the algorithm was starting to promote their content more and more. Conventional content creators were upset by this. To them, it felt as though YouTube was abandoning a beautiful culture that was being cultivated for the past 11 years. 
Additionally, creators began to speculate that these mainstream celebrities were contributing to a sterilization of this community through preferential advertisement deals being made. So how do you get attention and show the world that community-driven content is worth its investment? You attract attention. And a quick way to get attention is through shock and awe. You push the envelope. Edgy videos such as Deadly Twister, Vape Nation, and other content soared in popularity between late 2016 and early 17, rebelling against the perceived force change. Creators like Filthy Frank, iDubs, and H3H3 contributed to these trends, which consisted of vaping, moderate violence, and humorous self-harm. This raked in exceptional views and, dare I say it, exceptional content. At the same time, older YouTubers, primarily PewDiePie, started to see this trend more clearly after the 2016 YouTube Rewind. So, members of the community worked towards adapting their content to fit the trend of pushing the envelope. This turned out to be a catastrophic move, as it culminated in one of the most popular YouTubers in the world making some very unsavory comments. What's with the Christmas? I like the editing. As YouTube was just now starting to incorporate a more brand-friendly image through its adoption of A-list celebrities, this comment made advertisers very wary. For some advertisers, they found YouTube to now be completely unsafe to advertise on. Some of the biggest advertisers in the world, like Pepsi, Coke, and McDonald's, pulled out of the YouTube advertisement program. This presented a very major problem for the staff of YouTube. Creators were funded directly through the ads placed on their videos, and YouTube got a cut of that revenue. But with advertisers dropping like flies, the staff at YouTube were scared that their work promoting a brand-friendly platform was in danger. They were also scared that it took away an incentive for creators to make videos, which in turn would also affect YouTube's revenue. How could they mitigate this disaster? They know they have to work proactively to prevent advertisements from showing up on edgy content. Well, they had to make a change. And luckily, YouTube already had some infrastructure to utilize AI and machine learning to make these changes. As a subsidiary of Google, YouTube has some of the best software developers in the world. So they used artificial intelligence to garner a better understanding of each new video uploaded to the platform. From the perspective of a cybersecurity engineering student like myself, it seems like image recognition was used on the thumbnails, sentiment analysis was used on titles, and speech recognition was used to understand the content of videos. Michael, you can't just represent an entire community with a computer program. Yes, the fuck I can. For this bot to work, we need to know how Wall Street Bets feels about certain stocks. To do this, we're gonna use sentiment analysis, which is a natural language processing technique that uses machine learning. Say we're looking through my YouTube comments. One says, die forever bastard, I hate you. A sentiment analysis bot would classify that as negative. And if we look at another one that says, I think you're great, also I have a super cool robot idea for you. A sentiment analysis bot would classify that as super fucking negative because your idea probably sucks ass. To train a sentiment analysis bot, you need a lot of labeled data. So a lot of samples of text that are labeled positive or negative by a human. There are a lot of these data sets out there that are publicly available, but the text is like normal person talking. Allow users to log in and label the data for me. I use that data set to train a sentiment analysis bot. And now every morning when the fish is trading stocks, this bot is going on r slash wall street bet. It's looking through the top posts of the day until it finds what it likes. And then it buys the stock that that post is talking. About. As we can see here, sentiment analysis was used to determine if a piece of text is considered to be positive, negative, or some other emotion. By utilizing this on the titles along with the transcript of each video utilizing voice recognition, an algorithm could theoretically determine what is safe to advertise on and what isn't safe to advertise on, defined by YouTube's own internal rules. Additionally, sentiment analysis can be used on images as well, as AI can be trained over time to determine if a thumbnail is desirable or not, based off of how many clicks it gets. So YouTube now has a solution. Sentiment analysis can be used to determine the content of the video to see if it's safe, as well as determine what videos may be preferred to the user. In short, to the developers at YouTube, they probably thought that they found a way to optimize recommended long form and save content while also determining eligibility of monetization. Moreover, a new system of staggered pay was created. Based on the reputation of how many videos are monetized by a content creator, it could determine its pay for each individual YouTuber in the form of CPM, or cost per minute. This sounds great. Reward safe content, punish bad content, and show users more of what they want to see. This keeps advertisers and helps the community. Good idea, right? Well, for every decision that's made, there's always unforeseen consequences. As most computer scientists know, AI needs to be trained. 
Basically, you need to run hundreds of thousands of tests and pick the best performer. Take a look at this clip from CodeBullet. Okay, so the plan for the AI is very simple. I'm gonna whip out Old Faithful and Charles Darwin this shit. I'm talking the evolutionary algorithm. Sounds sexy and is sexy. We just generate a bunch of jumpy boys and make them do random moves. Then the ones that perform better get to live on and the ones that don't get executed. It's the same strat that I would use for raising children if I was allowed near them. Anyway, those who live on get all nasty and then babies happen. Then we mutate the babies just for fun and whammy, we got a new generation that's better than the last. Keep that up for a while and you got some smart boys. Okay, let's assemble the squad. Oh. Hey, that's better. Okay, so the plan is we're only gonna let these guys have a certain amount of moves. That way they can optimize, say, the first five moves before they work on the next five. Also, if a player reaches the next level, then I'm just gonna have all the players start from that point instead of running the whole thing again and again and again because that will take forever, especially with 44 levels. Finally, before I let these boys fly, I need to define the fitness function, which is what we use to tell if a player is good or not so we know who to kill. This is fairly simple for this game. If up, good. If down, bad. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. There are some levels where I need to add further incentive because the ideal path goes up and then down and then up again. Uh, and the guys will never figure this out because they will refuse to go down since we've taught them that down is bad. So to fix this, I added a little collectible, which if the AI collects, it will be rewarded. That way, it'll be encouraged to actually go down and get it. The AI has to run thousands of iterations randomly until a desired outcome is obtained. In this scenario, it completes jumping after thousands of random little changes. YouTube's algorithm is likely made of many different parts acting in tandem like this. And when YouTube released this new aspect of their infrastructure, it was very unreliable. Firstly, I want to apologize for this video being so late. I finished it yesterday and uploaded it, and then I was hit with that beautiful restricted ads icon. I had no idea why the video was restricted, there was no language in the video, and the clips shown of PewDiePie were completely censored. So I took it upon myself to be a little Reddit detective and find out why the video got restricted. Firstly, I uploaded a clip of PewDiePie screaming. The video was monetized. Then I uploaded another example of PewDiePie saying the N-word. The video was restricted. After that, I posted a video of PewDiePie crying with this title. The video was monetized. Afterwards, I went ahead and uploaded another video of PewDiePie screaming, but the audio was replaced with him saying the N-word. The video was restricted. Shortly after that, I uploaded the visual clip of PewDiePie saying the N-word, but replaced the audio with him screaming. The video was still restricted. And last but not least, I uploaded a clip of Bill Meyer actually saying the n-word on live tv and the video was completely monetized as we can see youtube's ai was demonetizing videos for seemingly unknown reasons youtube themselves even claimed that the videos were going to be demonetized at the beginning but over time this would improve this was the ai being trained but at a cost youtube was hurting the community that it wanted to help Initially, real-world people who dedicated a decent chunk of their lives to content creation were losing some of their only revenue sources for YouTube to fix this advertisement problem. This added stress on creators made them rightfully angry. Behind the scenes, there was an unknown godlike structure which was controlling their revenue stream. This led edgy creators, the most famous being Filthy Frank, to leave YouTube in its entirety in the September of 2017. But over time, this technology seemed as though it was very helpful for curbing problematic content. The AI looked like it was becoming more adept at moderating content on the platform. From the perspective of an outsider, a natural progression that would have happened with or without PewDiePie's comments was taking place. But the secret is, the developers probably didn't fully understand how the AI works either. Developers don't know each of the thousands of iterations which causes AI to make its decisions. And when they need to be tweaked, the algorithm changes again and again. And another thing about creating neural networks is that when they are being tweaked, they can accidentally learn an unknown bias. This is called AI doping. Many developed algorithms can have bias to show content that seems to fit a pattern. Think of a CAPTCHA. Pick all the traffic lights. Well, not only do you, the user, show that you are indeed a real human being behind the computer, but you also help train an AI. By having a large sample size to tweak the intelligence of an AI, the AI can have less errors. But a doped AI involving image recognition suggests that though there was some training with a large sample size, the AI could still contain errors which prioritizes, say, the traffic lights post rather than the yellow housing of the lights. This error of unknown consequences leads us to our next chapter.
In November of 2017, it seemed as though the algorithm latched onto a new pattern. Content which included Disney's superhero characters, colorful thumbnails, and minimal speech within the videos started to be favored. To the algorithm, colorful thumbnails were attractive to the masses. The minimal language found in the videos seemed to pass through the voice recognition filters unfazed, and as kids were watching this content, their watch time was massive in comparison to other content on the platform. This also coincidentally coincided with the blossoming market of iPad kids. Because of this, creators like Ryan's toy reviews and Cocomelon started to gain massive amounts of popularity, with views and subscribers in the tens of millions. But other creators wanted in on the fad. Creators who will not be named for obvious reasons, dressed in superhero morph suits and Elsa costumes. With little to no dialogue, alongside thumbnails which were colorful and eye-catching, the YouTube algorithm liked this content as it adhered to the rules that YouTube set for it. The speech recognition found nothing wrong within the content and the thumbnails garnered high amounts of engagement. But the content within these child-friendly videos seemed to be presenting very adult themes. Then one day, Matt Watson, also known as Matt's What It Is, made a video exposing the kind of content that was being viewed on the YouTube Kids app, resulting in a 4.4 million view video and a major mainstream news firestorm. This resulted in another advertisement crisis, with major brands like Mars, Adidas, and Deutsche Bank pulling out of the advertisement program, along with the FTC fining YouTube and Google $107 million for violating children's privacy. YouTube was in damage control mode, trying to do everything they could to moderate content on their platform. During this time, things were starting to reach a peak of how well YouTube could moderate content, especially with the technology at hand. And on top of this, highly respected and paying advertisers were starting to leave en masse. YouTube was then forced to find a permanent solution as soon as possible. Additionally, CPMs for child-friendly and conventional channels were cut and strictly monitored. This is because YouTube had less advertisers and since advertisers were looking for reform within YouTube's system. Because of this, YouTube wanted to be on their best behavior. This was a good change to protect children, but it also required YouTube to change its algorithm once again, adding more financial strain on creators and unintended and unknown consequences for the changes to the algorithm. As time went on, things normalized once again, but around 2018, 2019, the creator community wanted to understand the algorithm better. In the wake of misinformation campaigns and ever decreasing CPM rates, it led creators to think back to a time when YouTube was seemingly the wild west, when CPMs were high. Bad actors and creators alike wanted to know how the algorithm worked in order to spread their influence. This resulted in the demonetization report, as well as brute force attempts to understand the algorithm. A group of computer scientists were trying to determine what can cause videos to become demonetized. This resulted in a community compiled list of words that can get videos demonetized. Additionally, this spawned creators like Nerd City, whose goal was to understand how YouTube could work better for creators. Regarding bad actors, as you can see in the Smarter Every Day clip, misinformation spreaders were uploading very similar pieces of content, but only modifying bits and pieces to see how YouTube's neural networks would respond. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi just keeps racking up wins over Donald Trump. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi just keeps racking up wins over Donald Trump. It's the exact same stuff, just trying to manipulate things in the other direction. If you look at this channel specifically, it was started over 10 years ago by what appears to be an actual human. It uploaded a bunch of gaming content, and then at this moment, right here, it started uploading videos about politics. At this point, it's clear to me this is not just low quality content. This is a coordinated attack against the YouTube algorithm, complete with countermeasures. This is a serious, well funded, activity done by people meant to do harm. The algorithm is a black box. It holds a ton of power. It determines what you can upload, what is safe for kids, what is safe for advertisers, as well as what conforms to the goals of YouTube as a corporation. It's a very delicate balancing act. If full comprehension was gained by a specific YouTuber, they would game the system and be able to spread misinformation or overinflate their popularity. But who survived these massive changes? The big YouTubers. The YouTubers who bought stock early. Take a look at creators like Smosh, Philip DeFranco, PewDiePie, Markiplier, and the Sidemen. They captured fame early on. They had the capital to survive these massive changes. PewDiePie managed to reform his reputation after the apocalypse. Philip DeFranco started to diversify his revenue sources through things like Rogue Rocket and Beautiful Bastard Apparel. And creators of Smosh, Ian Hecox and Anthony Padilla, managed to outsource their talent to other equally talented employees. Moreover, A-list celebrities who made the transition in 2016 
also managed to stay on top as they already had the social capital from being established within the mainstream media. Due to exceptionally low CPMs and a shift in promotional content, a paradigm shift was created. This, alongside YouTube's preference towards long-form content, allowed long videos to be preferred, with many pre-roll ads, as long as the video was over 10 minutes long. This allowed beautiful long-form content to prosper, but a new barrier to entry was inadvertently created. Popular videos needed high-fidelity video, high-quality animations, as well as exceptional storytelling. And with the competition and tacit preference of mainstream media figures on the YouTube algorithm, the competition became intense. For many wannabe creators, it wasn't about the creator anymore. It wasn't about the essence of what made YouTube, an individual's extreme interest being shared with the masses. Instead, it was about being a brand, something further exemplified through YouTube's integration of A-list celebrities in the past. Its promotion of YouTube premium shows and its soft banning of channels, which may have been too edgy, showed YouTube's larger plan of becoming more brand friendly. The content became more and more tame. For example, iDubs went from I'm gay <laughs> to making videos on saving squirrels alongside amazing feature length documentaries. This new progression on YouTube was beautiful. The content was fantastic and kept users engaged. This birthed the creators like Lamino, Polymatter, Real Life Lore, and Wendover Productions. This progression could be seen as natural, but users and content creators alike started to notice the 10 minute and one second time signature, which slowly grew over time to 20, or even 30 minutes. Additionally, the YouTube algorithm really liked consistent upload schedules too. This favored channels from Philip DeFranco to Smosh to Ellen that could afford to hire outside production help with filming, animations, and editing. No, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because creators are now helping make more jobs for very, very talented people. But as mentioned, this wasn't a totally natural progression. The AI formed these seemingly happy accidents, but this was at the cost of newer creators. Let's now take a look at Mr. Beast. He started his career doing insanely crazy stuff, like counting to 100,000, attempting to stand or water for 24 hours, trying to break glass with megaphones, and so on. People love this personally challenging content. Over time, he and his cohorts have progressed into the biggest YouTube channel in the world. He learned different aspects of the algorithm by utilizing childlike thumbnails, content which was challenging but not edgy, and created a brand. He then outsourced and grew. Essentially, Mr. Beast treaded a fine line of staying close to the graph of the extreme, yet acceptable content. If content gets closer to that line, it gets less engagement, not more. While utilizing an exploit from the second adpocalypse, you may find this to be a success story, but I find this to be very unnatural. YouTube used to be about you, the creator, sharing moments of your life just talking to a camera. Brian Higa just wanted to make videos that were funny to him. Philip DeFranco just wanted to talk about his opinion on the news. PewDiePie just wanted to play games and share his experiences. Now, creators like Mr. Beast have dedicated extreme effort to appeal to an unknown godlike structure, which determines if your content is good enough the algorithm, an algorithm which promotes high fidelity visuals and narratives, mixing long form and regular content which can be neatly packaged and consumed. And for content creators to be able to make exceptional content that adheres to the algorithm, they hinder the viewer's experience through product placements after a multitude of pre-roll ads, promotions of Patreon, as well as regular video announcements of burnout. Done. This is I'm all done. caused by AI an AI created by programmers who realistically can't fully comprehend how it works. How often do you see a new creator on YouTube that has an average quality video and roughly 10 minutes of content? From personal experience, the last time I saw this genuine creation of content was when Janelle burst into the scene with her viral video of her pet snake and van. She went from millions of views of video to now maybe a couple hundred thousand. In my opinion, it looks as though the algorithm gods have moved away from her kind of content after the rollout of YouTube Shorts. Or maybe people just moved on. Regardless of how the algorithm works, you and I can agree that YouTube is the giant of the industry, with very little competition. So its changes have probably been for the better, right? Well, enter TikTok. Without going into the backstory of the social media platform, people mainly know it as a popular short-form content app, similar to Vine. However, its growth since 2020 has been exceptional. New content creators emerge from the woodworks utilizing a tool that's in their pockets to capture aspects of everyday life alongside adding new tools for trends, such as reusing other creators' audio. Its success is in its simplicity. Scroll until you find something that's interesting. If not, keep scrolling. Depending on if a video is like saved or watched to its entirety, 
TikTok recommends similar content. Take a look at this graph. TikTok has already surpassed YouTube for how long the user spends on average on the platform per month. Like YouTube, it has its own algorithm, but it isn't as micromanaged. Additionally, due to its ease of use, its accessibility could turn a person into a celebrity overnight. Take a look at Keith Lee, a professional MMA fighter turned food reviewer. He has garnered millions of views, followers, and likes just by recording himself eating on his phone. His content is amazing because of his personality and his dedication to honesty. There's no ads. Luckily, Keith Lee has a way to monetize his success through a partner program called the TikTok Creator Fund, a program which he is very likely a part of. There is no production team, no ad placements, no algorithm constraints. He was just being himself, and people liked watching. Seeing him thrive makes me think back to the early days of YouTube. As a channel manager for a small YouTube creator, a cybersecurity engineering student, an artificial intelligence researcher, and an avid consumer of YouTube and TikTok, I can personally say that I've seen and felt a massive difference within TikTok and YouTube's algorithms. Recently, I've seen specific videos on TikTok go viral, catapulting people into brand new careers. This is something I find to be quite scarce on YouTube at this point in time, mainly because of the barrier to entry has become too high unless you're exceptionally talented. This is why YouTube came up with a copycat program of YouTube Shorts. TikTok is now a real threat to YouTube, so the YouTube algorithm has now started to prioritize Shorts. This has allowed some YouTubers to receive millions of views and subscribers. This is a good thing, right? Well, kind of. The promotion and use of YouTube Shorts has created inflation for views and subscribers on a platform. From personal experience, though I love Keith Lee, I don't wait till his next video. I wait till TikTok promotes his content to me. It's organic that way, but YouTube has inadvertently become the home for independent long-form content. This is purely due to its algorithm. So while YouTube wants to cash in on this explosive growth format, it also hurts the newer creators prioritizing conventional horizontal video, mainly due to the fact that the subscribers who stay and watch for long-form content hold more value than short-form content. This is exemplified by the pay difference offered by YouTube Shorts versus conventional YouTube partner content. While regular YouTube content has a 55% split according to a 2013 news article, Shorts only have a 45% split. On top of this artificially inflated value of Shorts, the algorithmic competition that YouTube is facing is staggering. Here's an example. This is a video I helped produce which garnered 5.1 thousand views at the time of recording. But if we look at the same content which was uploaded to his TikTok, 100 thousand views were garnered alongside thousands of followers. The content being shown is the same, albeit split into parts and the viewers are engaging and enjoying it on both platforms. The only major difference here is the way the algorithm promotes these videos. The content is the same, but the content's promotion through different algorithms shows an extreme disadvantage to newer conventional creators on YouTube. TikTok's algorithm has its flaws, but YouTube seems to have a history of much larger ones. It has an algorithm which has become very demanding to current creators I alongside creating a very high barrier to entry for new ones. It's also bloated through many iterations, safety barriers, and a speculation of error-prone human-modified behavior. And its new introduction of shorts seems like it's having a hindering effect on conventional creators as well. But looking back, I can't help but notice that the issues within the YouTube community and platform stemmed from YouTube intervening. YouTube is obviously accountable for keeping members of the community safe, specifically kids. But members of the community were also the people who were speaking out and calling for reform mainly through Elsagate, the YouTube Heroes debacle, as well as the announcement of burnout from content creators. Creators gave valid input that aspects of the site should be more monitored, well thought out, and humane. In fact, I feel as though all of the aforementioned issues with YouTube's culture and monetization stems from one decision, the rollback of the YouTube Heroes program. Although not proven, I will posit the following hypothetical scenario based on the information that I've presented to you. Based on dire needs to moderate content in the wake of misinformation being spread around the 2016 U.S. presidential election, YouTube had to learn from their competition in order to keep up with advertisers. With this in mind, YouTube decides to go down a hybrid route, utilizing moderation techniques from Reddit and Twitch to train large-scale artificial intelligence algorithms seen on sites like Facebook and Twitter to moderate content through sentiment analysis. So, they announce YouTube Heroes. Instantly, YouTube receives backlash from creators due to obvious vulnerabilities and they pull the plug on the program to attempt to reform the issues that the creators had with it. But then the apocalypse happens, due to a creator-made scandal. In the wake of this, YouTube decides that community-driven moderation schemes is no longer viable, as they cannot trust the feedback of the creators to be beneficial for the company as a whole. 
So YouTube immediately started to work to implement an AI exclusive algorithm to moderate content. The AI is trained in small batches, but after releasing this new moderation system, YouTube realizes that this solution does not work at scale. Eric Schmidt was there and he said, every problem that we have is a problem at scale. This resulted in horrible initial issues. Reactionary tuning of the AI fixes it, but YouTube needs a larger data set to have an effective AI. But YouTube at this point already scrapped the Heroes program. The community can't train the AI in mass. So over time, the AI is tweaked behind the scenes, allowing for YouTube initiatives to be prioritized and leaving creators in the dark. In short, the community's initial backlash to YouTube heroes caused creators to essentially lose aspects of self-determination within the algorithm. Due to this, content creators are forced to bend over backwards to understand an algorithm which they aren't trained to understand. Creators must prepare for any future adpocalypse, deal with unknown enforcement of rules, tacit favoritism of initiatives from YouTube itself, and irregular revenue streams. If this community enforcement was available from its initial rollout in 2016, there may have been a chance to allow the community to self-moderate, preventing things like Elsagate through mass flagging, disincentivizing content like PewDiePie's Fiverr video through the same means, as well as maybe even preventing other non-mentioned scandals like the Suicide Forest situation caused by Logan Paul. It's even possible that with the intervention of YouTube heroes, community members could sway the company to slowly transform to short-form content, bringing them more in line with their greatest competitor. This community-driven situation can work. According to a Reddit community post, there were around 830,000 posts a day in 2020. This number has surely grown. These were policed by thousands of moderators on the platform, and with this in mind, has had very minimal advertiser backlash over the course of its existence on the internet. Furthermore, a hybrid system of AI and communal care could even make the algorithm more efficient. By having the community train the algorithm, they can become the essence of what the AI deems to be problematic or successful. This in turn allows for greater revenue for creators, and therefore less reliance on third-party ventures for revenue like Patreon and merchandise. By doing this, YouTube can gain more exclusivity in its monetary generation policies, rather than attempting to add more revenue sources to an already bloated site. Additionally, sites like Reddit allow for auto-moderation per community, allowing members to write their own programs to tailor the policing of a specific community. If YouTube implemented this within a hybrid system, responses from the algorithm could be more nuanced in a way that could help each community. But that's all a hypothetical. As it stands now, YouTube is not for you anymore. It's not a place to share your life, your passions, or be organic. It's a place for independent TV shows to exist. And even when you conform to this new strategy, it's not even guaranteed to generate revenue due to YouTube's overpleasing of content, the increasing difficulty of carving out a niche for upcoming creators, as well as the difficulty of finding an audience. As a person who has deep love for YouTube, TikTok, and technology, I can only see the writing on the wall. It seems as though YouTube is going the way of Facebook and Twitter. YouTube is overloading one site to attempt to do everything. YouTube should take a page out of TikTok's playbook, not by copying its style, but instead by simplifying and perfecting. YouTube is its community. Without that, its competition will learn from its mistakes. In short, YouTube doesn't work for creators anymore creators work for. It's important to not lose your voice. I know it sounds simple, it, but it's not talking about like, we can't be silenced. We have no, that's not what it's talking about. It's important to not lose your voice. Meaning in today's internet where you make things and you put them on the internet, it's easy to forget who you are. You forget who you are. And that's what I want to talk about today. Let me describe the problem like this. Every content creator knows this. When I make a piece of content for the internet, do I make the video that is the truest reflection of my voice, of who I am? Or do I give in to the temptation, that voice that's always in the back of your mind that says, you know, if you change your content in this way or do this to it, you might make something that performs better. 